Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, Data Model Patterns. And this is moderated by the esteemed Karen Lopez. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Joining to us today are, well, we hopefully are two great panelists who we are <laughs> returning panelists to the series, Paul Agnew and David Hay. Paul is an author, consultant, and speaker with more than 20 years' experience in the data modeling and data integration fields in many different industries. Paul has extensive hands-on experience working in many different industries, including financial services, insurance and reinsurance, healthcare, healthcare informa informatics, sales and marketing, and manufacturing. Paul is an expert in solution architecture, data architecture, data quality, master data management, data warehousing, big data, and data governance. Also joining us, and hopefully joining us, and I'll just do a quick introduction to see if we can get him on the line, is David Hay, who has been producing data models to support strategic and requirements planning for more than 25 years, a president of Essential Strategies Incorporated for 20 years. Dave has worked in a variety of industries, including, among others, banking, clinical, pharmaceutical research, and all aspects of oil production and processing. Both Dave is also an author, and I will be sure to get you the information for both of their books in the follow-up email. And of course, I'm very pleased to introduce the moderator for this webinar series, Karen Lopez. Karen is a senior project manager and architect at Info Advisors. She specializes in the practical application of data management principles. Karen is a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist on professional data issues. She is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP specialized in, in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. And Karen wants you to love your data. And with that, I will give the floor to Karen. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Karen. You always do that so well. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for all you do to make this happen, Shannon, and also to Dataversity that hosts all these and a whole series of exciting webinars. And you can go find the webinars and all the great stuff and blogs. I also blog there at dataversity.net. I also wanted to thank again uh, C.A. Irwin, data modeler folks who sponsor this webinar series and, and are helping us make available to you every month and bringing all kinds of experts and diverse opinions and hopefully some wit and snark to the whole big challenges in data modeling. We're always looking for ideas about what topics we should be covering or who we should be inviting on. So you can always contact Shannon or use the chat or the uh, to know what you'd like to hear in future webinars. Um, a reminder, if you want to tweet or Facebook or E plus or other social media, since they all have hashtags now, use hash BC modeling, which is right there at the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. The other thing I wanted to talk about is this isn't a presentation. This is a panel. There won't be a whole bunch of slides or anything. So if your screen's not moving, that's OK. Um, that's just how we like to do it. We want to focus on the conversations. So I want to talk, oh, before that, I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about how, um, about how who you are. And sorry, Shannon, is that under share? The poll. Shannon, be muted. Yeah, if you go to the top, there's a drop down and the uh, poll on the or there's a poll icon at the top right. Oh yeah, sorry. That's okay, got it. I use too many platforms. Thanks. Uh -huh. So I want to know a little bit about you guys who are attending. Who are you? And I want to know what your title is. I want to know who you are. What what dream about? Okay, maybe nightmares. But what do you? What's your primary focus? And we see the poll results coming in. It's so exciting. It's just like election day. And looks 
like a big view, our hard time deciding who you are and what you do for a living. We won't tell your bosses. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll, which gives another 10 seconds. And she might um, give David some help. I think maybe he's got the wrong dial-in number. But he's here, so he'll be joining us soon. And I'm going to go ahead and show the poll results. That's a little thing spins a bit. And what I'm out out is that about half of you as attendees are data architects or modelers. We've got um, about 6% of project managers. And uh, some of you are developers and DAs or other IT professionals. And 20 of you are busy talking to your boss about why you're on a webinar or something and didn't answer. Let's go to the next question, which is, have you used pattern models? So pattern models, I mean third-party models that you didn't create in-house. So uh, these are pattern models such as the book David and Paul have, have uh, written, or third-party proprietary models that your company has purchased, or data you found on the Internet or um, industry standard data models. Just let you think about those for a minute. And I'm ahead and close that poll. You get 20 seconds to make up your mind whether you've actually done something or not. And while that's happening, for my own disclosure, is I've worked with industry standard data models, both being on standards body for them and implementing those, and we're going to talk about those. And go ahead and show the poll results. I hope you can see the poll result, results. Let's see. And what we see is um, a few. Uh, a small percentage of you, um, 15 percent of you, use pattern models on almost every project. About a quarter of you have done it once or twice before. Uh, about 50 percent of you haven't done it, but you'd like to. 25 percent of you uh, have used pattern models at all, and we'll talk about that hopefully. And some of you refuse to answer. So um, that goes to why this topic. So like I said, I've been working with some form of pattern models for a long time. So I've used both David's and uh, Paul and Lynn's models from their books and their models that are available. And I've worked mostly, though, with industry standard data models, which are, um, using the word standard is kind of a strong word there. They're usually industry associations that have gotten together to define some data standards around um, mostly data sharing among among industry partners. So for instance, the modeling standard I worked with was for retail, so it focused most on point of sale and inventory and scheduling and some niche markets. It was focused on, uh, they were focused on building a standard so that if a retailer wanted to go buy a package, that you would measure that package data requirements or da support data requirements against the standard model. And would also use their standard XML files for exchanging data in a standardized way across suppliers, vendors, potentially even customers, uh, and other retailers. So that was uh, an interesting, uh, I've been working on that one for a couple of decades, so I've seen it grow over the years. Um, but one of the things I noticed when I first started working with the standards models is that you know, use and adoption of standards models has really changed over the years. When I first started, that was a very niche thing. We didn't really, there weren't a lot of people doing and not very many people knew what they were. And I've just seen an explosion of those. There are all kinds of proprietary, expensive proprietary models. We're talking six or seven figures to buy uh, some enterprise standard model or enterprise pattern models. 
We're talking inexpensive ones that are in the tens of thousands, um, books that you can buy. There are websites dedicated to just sharing patterns for each other. Um, there's more of those, but that's also resulted in a series of fears around them, so fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I think part of that I want to talk about with my panelists is how to ever overcome those things with pattern models. I think there are so many myths about them, so I want to talk about those. I think there's a lot of skewed expectations for them, like what role they play. And number one reason, a number one myth I deal with is uh, salespeople for the proprietary ones will say, if you buy these models, you don't need data modelers or data architects because it's all done for you. Um, I also think that it changes how we do our work as modelers. I mentioned what is a pattern model. So I said industry standard models, pieces of patterns, such as in the book, so very, very small sets of models, the proprietary ones. And also, I'd even consider internal models, the things that you guys have developed in-house. They may be part of your enterprise data model. They might be just patterns from previous projects that you want to reuse. They all kind of, whether or not they exist or not, kind of changes what you do. One of the other things that's interesting about them is what form they come in. So the most common ones, and indeed David and Paul's ones, are uh, ERD-based, so relational data models. But in them in UML format, in XML format, in just as picture and diagrams, one that I work with is only released as in diagrams in a Word document. It makes it very hard to reuse those. I've seen them in spreadsheets or I've seen them in verbal specs, so specifications that list data requirements. My introduction there, and I want to get started. Um, I, uh, I think that I ask, start with Paul while we try to get David on the phone. Um, Paul, what do you think the biggest myths are about implementing data modeling patterns? The biggest uh, is, well, I'd say the first one is mine's right and yours is wrong. If you do it this way, don't do it that way. That's a complete other cobbler, if you ask me. <laughs> people, people, I mean, and, and I mean, I said it's about data modeling in general. Is there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's more like whether it's useful or not. So if you apply something that's not useful, then you know it's probably going to work for your particular situation. So I mean, you know, say that this is the right way to do things versus this is the wrong way to do things. That's I, I find that's a huge myth, and it really just bugs me when I hear about it. And mm -hmm. um, the in general. Um, one of the great ones, and this applies to patterns and, and data model uh, data data models in general, but patterns is that they're they're independent of technology. I've heard that old chestnut for years. <laughs> Why is that an issue? Why is that an issue? Because you have to go in if you're going to use patterns and stuff, you've got to realize that that things that you're using are set up for a particular way of doing things. Myself and, and, and David and, and Len Silverstone use relational patterns. Guess what? They're for relational data modeling systems, they, they, relational databases. They're set up to, to sort that because they're, we're using, let's, let's just, we're using the own math that Chen and those guys put together, and that's all relational, fact based math. If you're using data modeling patterns, they're modeling patterns that, you know, Gamma and Helm and and Johnson and John Vasidis put together for OO software. You know, you're you know it's a completely separate type of solution. You are you are forcing yourself to go into a solution. And that is, is that patterns are all being an all all thing kind of panacea for your data issues is not. I don't think is have to put it in a much more uh, maybe but a that, hard session. Uh, really then depend on what you're using the pattern for? Are you using it for inspiration to understand? For instance, uh, one of the patterns in your book is about just contact mechanisms and, and phone numbers and mm -hmm. email addresses and things like that. Um, you could be using that for inspiration to understand that, like one of my pet peeves lately is that businesses need to give up the fact that they believe that people only have one email address and only ever have one email address. And so 
um, you can implement the tracking of email addresses a billion different ways. Okay, maybe not that many, but a lot of different ways. Um, but that doesn't mean you know, patterns expressing the implementation. Well, be, be, be aware that models in general have two. You know, they have two two different purposes. Yeah. And I want to describe as purpose number two. I think it's purpose number one, but okay. Well, as a okay, purpose number one, I'm, I can, I, I'll actually give you that, and I think that's a complete thing to say. It's an expression of requirements. Well, data models, particularly in language data models, traditionally have also been used as a, as a basis for good database design. I, I think that that might have been sort of tuned into my brain over the years as well. I, I just think that modeling patterns the if you if you take it from the perspective as a good basis for for a requirement, sure, I, I, can, I can say you have to be it does have to be um, implemented the way in a related way. You could say that they are an expression of requirements, but for that expression of requirements is being used in notation that's been specifically designed for a relational world. Just be just be aware, aware that it's. That that's you know don't get in other words your thinking and view of the world are affected by the inputs that you get and remember that the pattern input you're get, you're getting from a lot of the relational patterns is 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 really you know focused. But I think yeah. Have a caveat and four. That's all. Yeah, exactly. So I, I one have of one my... really. I have okay, one go really ahead. My favorite myth: business cares. They, they, trust me, they care if it's going to cost them a whole bunch of money. And I, what I mean that is if you if you decide to go one way or the other, they're like, that's why I deploy you. But they're about cash flow. They care about profits. They care about the shareholder value. They care yeah. whether you're using Pines or David's designs or Len's designs. Sure, that you don't cost me a whole bunch of cash. That's true for all decisions that we make in IT and, in theory, in the whole business, right? Is that, really, you know, I talk about how, um, you know, our jobs in IT, but specifically data people, are to help the company make more money or decrease costs, or more revenue, decrease costs, decrease the risk, and keep the CIO out of jail. And sometimes <laughs> pattern models can help with, with all of those, right? I think pa pattern models can help with all of those things. They can help you reduce, I mean, that's the cost benefit of models. I mean, if you are off, so what did the rules do for us lately? <laughs> you know, that, that question. What did the Romans do for me lately? Well, what the Romans did is they built roads, and they built schools, and they built, and they built roads to a standard. They built them to a pattern. They built, you know, they had a, a pattern to it. I mean, the pharaohs didn't wake up in the morning and look out onto the desert and say, you know what, that's another big pointy thing. What were they called? I mean, they had a pattern. They had a template. Every bridge that yeah. you look around, Manhattan, can't leave with bridges. There are yeah. some patterns and all those besides it. I mean, it's yeah. pretty, what these patterns do, you know, they're industry standard models like you described, whether they're, yeah. you know, the excellent work that, David's done, and it's the excellent mm -hmm. work that Len's done, and that's the stuff that you know people around the world have done. It just you don't start off with a blank, blank page. Yeah, I guess that's the name of one of my presentations, right? The don't start you know. starting with it. Yeah, starting with a blank page, and and you know not doing that, not starting with a blank page. Um, one of the myths that just drives me bonkers in this space. And then I hear the sales guy saying it and gals saying it every time I, I go to one of these pitches, is that it saves time. And my feeling on that is it doesn't save time. Like it doesn't mean it just goes faster. It just allows me to spend time on the more important things. So, for instance, the core differences my business has or the uniqueness to it. So I'm not spending a whole bunch of time researching honey reaching on how email works 
or postal addresses work or how I should model st- statuses and, and categories, that those things aren't line of business differentiators. They're just you know, stuff that you know we should be reinventing every single time we create a data model. What do you think about the it saves time thing? I agree that it saves time, um, but if time is available, we'll use it up for whatever we can. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. If, you, if you give us six months for a project, we'll take six months for a project. At the end of the six months, you'll have a much better data model. I mean, looking at like, we, myself and I, I always, I have this rule of thumb, mm-hmm. and, that, and it's um, basically, it, it basically works off actually two rules of thumb because I have two thumbs. Rule of thirds is one of them and then the rule of patterns. And the rule of thirds that I use is um, if you can look at every data model and look at it in three ways. Everyone does it, our industry does it, and this is the thing that we are that we are the only ones to do it. So in other words, everybody does emails. Everybody does addresses. So if there's a pattern available, whoever pattern that that belongs to, you be using that pattern. It leaves the basis. In the telecoms industry, if I'm a gene- if I'm in the genetics industry, yeah. which I'm in, you mean a lot of the a lot of the um the specific to that industry. Um but every genetic every genetic testing company in the world uses it. Every yeah. telecoms uh, company in the world is gonna have a network. Every financial Company girls um, are going to be doing trades, loans, and have securities. Mm-hmm. And right. you should be consistent. But it's that third. It's us special as a company. We do different that makes us competitively different. It's where patterns, you, you can't use patterns. That's where, you know, the patterns fall down because it's unique. Patterns by their nature are not unique. And yeah. what we do in our View world is is that we say let us handle the first two thirds. Let us help us you with the third, those you know two thirds at the beginning. That last third, that's that's where we really need to concentrate our data modeling effort. Yeah, so, and that's those. right. And so uh, I'll disagree with you a little bit. Is that I've helped clients implement these industry standard models when they wanted to change their old world views of the data in their business space and bring it more into uh, the modern era. So things like they didn't track any electronic communications at all. They, um, uh, you know, believed that people who live at the same dr- address always have the same last name. They, yeah. Um, yeah, um, or that people only had one residence or that. I mean, these all sound like really basic things, but even when you get into their core parts like so for instance one of the big ways that this pattern model helped a lot of my clients was uh, actually correctly supporting international data so even they weren't yeah. an international business per se their customers were all in the US they needed to start you know, re-engineering some of their systems to recognize the fact that they actually had suppliers and outside the US hmm. yeah and and so that's the, the the some of the benefits of some of the patterns can help people with their core business, even the uniqueness of it, that they could decide, well, we want to support this type of internationalization, but not this type over here. International stuff, that's because you're Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> it's all your Canadian stuff coming out there. It's, it's my Canadian influence trying to change the world. The world needs a little yeah. bit more Canada. It needs a lot more. <laughs> um, come on, so, come on, come on. But, Yes. Oh, David's on. Thank you, David. Yes. This must have been driving you crazy well, not you being me? able to hear. We can hear you can loud you hear and clear. You can hear yep. me? My dog. Ah, technology. Excellent. I hate computers. <laughs> Excellent. So, David, since you just came on, Paul and I have been talking about um, some of the myths of pattern models. What's your favorite or right. most hit, was, depending on your point of view? I was listening to you guys. See, the, the thing that was upset is I could hear you guys. You didn't hear me. <laughs> Which is particularly frustrating okay. in my world, in my mind. Okay. I'm, that so kind of, I'm not that kind of guy that listens and doesn't talk. Uh, myths of the data modeling. Um, one of them is the one that you mentioned, Paul, about uh, being, being actually being technologically biased. 
Um, and my problem is that, yes, most people who do data modeling are technologically biased, but I don't think that's how it should be. I view data modeling as a way of trying to identify the underlying simplicity in what otherwise looks like a really complicated world. And, uh, I do that by looking for, as, as Richard Barker said, the things of significance and the facts that connect them together. Uh, and, and it's true that the tools that we use that do to be aware of things like foreign keys, which drives me nuts, because what we have is two things that are related to each other, and that's what's important. Um, and early on, again, because of my particular training, it was uh, the modeling, the semantics of the business. And in my first book, I talked about the semantic, the patterns were in effect semantic standards as opposed to syntactic standards that everybody was talking about. So, um, uh, it's very funny, a few years ago, I thought that maybe data modeling was becoming passe and uh, nobody was interested. Suddenly, the word semantics became a hot topic, and I said, hey, I'm cool again. But that's <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah. So David, that, David let me interrupt yes. you for a second, David, go ahead, before please. you go on. So on that, that topic, um, do you think even, so we're talk, specifically we're talking about pattern models, do you think mm -hmm. this is sort of the, one of the bigger issues in our whole industry is that we do a lousy job of explaining all types of data models and why we data model because we're lousy marketers? Uh, I'd say there's something to that. I recommend yeah. everybody go to YouTube, Kinds of Data Models. You will find my little presentation on exactly that subject. You okay. can go to our clients and complain that, you know, you really don't use language very consistently. And we've got to come in and help you straighten it all out. And, but we have this problem that, okay, what do you mean by a logical data model? What do you mean by a conceptual data model? If you've got people there, there are at least six different opinions. And, uh, yeah, I agree. That's that's a, a serious issue. I asked campaign to raise that what we're supposed to be doing is creating ontologies. What you should recognize is the first 2,500 year old hot new buzzword. Uh, that was the branch of philosophy that was concerned with what exists. And it is that if you do it right, your model is going to be a representation of what exists. And then new new uh, technologies going on for for uh, modeling that uh, the semantic web. Some of you probably heard yep. of. Yep. Is you know, it's interesting because you take your data model and put it into OWL, but you can also OWL stuff that is completely un <laughs> unaddressable by what we do in data modeling. Right, because all that interesting stuff in the semantic world. Like I'm also following and paying attention to what's going on there, and. One of the things that, as I attend the semantic stuff, is that you know part of their approach is to kind of think about data as a pattern with things like URIs, these universal identifiers, and URLs, and mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. Is at least on many traditional IT projects, I think they're trying to recognize the fact that their data we have about things, even though they would just say we have things, we don't have data about them, mm -hmm. that the data we have about things, and we shouldn't go redefining it for every single project in our company, not even every <laughs> single project across companies, right? Right, right. Learn that well, from that's, that. That's a piece of it, and the whole notion of the universal uh, ontology, which is sort of what I tried to do, my, that was my attitude behind my last book, was to have sort of universal categories here. And it was with that. Now, one of the amusing things, if you get hanging out with those folks, so, is that point out that, that is, if we're coming from a world of, of databases and relational databases, we have what's called a closed world assumption, which is that if it doesn't follow our rules, it's out. We are not <laughs> But if you're doing an exploratory kind of thing, which one is the open world assumption, which says that if data doesn't violate a particular rule, it could be true. And that's the world of a whole lot of interesting things. Yeah. It's not what we are interested in in data models and our data model patterns and look at it, give people an opportunity to say, okay, here's a basic set of things we think are true. And right. use that as a starting point and go do your exploration and see what else you can find. That's a really uh, good point. So one of the things I tell people who are working with pattern models is don't treat them like legislation and law unless legislation and law mm -hmm. requires you to follow them to a T, <laughs> right? right? So I, I remind right. people that even the entire Internet 
that is built on not standards technically, mm-hmm. but, but what are risk for comments that we implement as standards. And we realize that if mm-hmm. you want to build your own email system, you want to exchange emails with people all over the world, if you violate mm-hmm. the RSC, there's a good chance that your email won't get through or you won't receive it. So it's right. kind of a self-policing, you know, I mean, you can get certifications well, and stuff, and there are certifications in data models. I wanted to ask Paul, Paul, what do you feel about what Dave is saying here about um, all these different types of models and everything? Uh, yeah, I mean, David's view is very interesting, and I'm, for the most part, absolutely correct. Um, I do have a few my caveat and tour, which is um, something that, in a way, myself and David are, are, are any data modeler, you know, we are, are affected by this. I got, I got the Heisenberg and certainly the principle of data mm-hmm. modeling, mm. really by the fact that we are actually going out there and designing things in a particular way, whether that's relationally or UML or however we've touched the system in such a way that we've affected it. So, it's, it, I mean, whether the effect is is detrimental or not, um, that's a totally different um, question. But well, be well, aware. Well, but hold on, Dave. So, just just be aware that um, that that exists. So, just be careful, everybody out there. Don't lock yourself into a into a viewpoint. Don't lock yourself into one way of looking at the world. Mm-hmm. I think David David is absolutely correct in what he said. Is that it's an it's an ontology type of way. Of um, and what we, David and myself, do is that it becomes complicated. We're trying to give you the tools, the patterns, that maybe make less complication out there. That fundamental, looking at the fundamental particles of data modeling, and we're trying to figure out what those fundamental particles are. I guess that's what I would say. Well, I mean, Paul, you did a really good job of in your book doing sort of level data model patterns, so doing the atomic patterns. And absolutely the raw materials, if you will, uh, more sort of global, and I try to put those together in something meaningful at, at the next level up. But uh, you're, you're right. It's a matter of having a patterns in, in the models that you build, a sort of raw material structure that people can build on. Uh, it's the notion of it being a foundation that people build on, not that, that, that this is the thing. However, in order for the foundation to be right, it has to be based on relatively true things. And uh, my my book has six base categories of people and organizations and geographic locations, these physical stuff and time, and that's the who, what, where, when, why, and you know who, what, where, when, how. Uh, why actually happens when you get more complex and you talk about we're selling things as contracts or we're building things and and that's at the next level up of, of attraction. But if you get the right raw material. So if you get the right components, then the rest of it becomes a lot easier. In a way, I, I want to echo that as well. And, and I, I see, um, in a way, the, it's, a, it's a two for me. Um, that us as the modelers, one of the, the, the thing I hate, I, I hear a lot, and I hear from from them is, oh, data modeling is as much art as it is science. And I, when I heard, <laughs> I heard that, I just I go crazy. I go nuts. I just I'm with you. And, and the reason why I go nuts is it's not science and it's not art. It should be engineering. It's engineering discipline. However, to do the engineering, I guess, um, from 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 perspectives, um, people like myself and, and obviously David are working on it, trying to get a little bit of science, a little science and a little science behind yeah. particles and. David looks at things from a he's like a cosmologist. He looks at the <laughs> right. universe, whereas right. I'm a right. I'm a fundamental. I'm I'm he's right. I'm, I'm more Higgs boson type of guy. Look at right. Yeah. So it's not engineering; it's philosophy. You understand that that after my my undergraduate degree in philosophy, it never occurred to me that I would actually get a job, which was being a professional philosopher. So what is the nature? What is the fundamental nature of things? What's going on here? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So some of the other topics, I want to make sure we get to all these things because I know we could eat. We're all, all the three are kind of philosophers as well. I mean, we think a lot <laughs> about what we're I, doing and why and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I, I, so, I prefer I prefer to be the, the physicist 
Sorry. Okay, the physicists. Well, there there are philosophical physicists as well, or okay. physics philosophers. Right. Okay. Anyway, go on. So, right. and yeah. so um, one of the things is is that one of the criticisms I hear about, about these, especially the proprietary ones, but even the industry standard ones, is that they're too generalized, and I mean abstract, generalized. So we don't see, you know, there isn't a box for department and division. There's not a box with some lines on it for um, state. You know, they've you internationalization. Know funny and, and, yeah, it's funny about hey, that. Let me interject here because I have done my models to business executives and I have models to IT people. Business executives, if you if you go to them and you say, well, you've got, you've got an employee here and you've got an agent there and you've got somebody who's both an employee and an agent and so on and so forth, how do we call this? You know, they have no Quite happy to generalize. They say, you know, you're right. Those are, are members of larger category. The mm-hmm. IT people go bonkers. They're used to thinking in very specific categories. And if you talk yeah. about different categories than the ones that they know, they can't deal with it. That's because my experience has been exactly the opposite. That okay. The business people go bonkers that I don't have yeah. a box for employee, temp worker. And I might have subtyping to do this. Uh-huh. But these these abstract generalized contract uh, concepts in their data models and their implementations. Mm-hmm. Now, I keep trying to remind them the end users don't have to be exposed to that terminology in the data model. Mm-hmm. You can of still course. call a screen. But um, they really, at times, are very frustrated by that because they want to think in terms of their business lingo. You know, mm-hmm. if if they well, call their, um, you know, call their invoices orders, like some company do, or receipts <laughs> invoices, which well, yeah, is part, it come in in parts of the world. And, you know, they're frustrated that the model doesn't well, that it's their model. Shouldn't it be that way? Well, there's, that, that, that's one of the things I touched in, in my video, that, that you have two layers in there. One is what I call a semantic model, which is exactly what you say, exactly the semantics of the business. And there you can you capture that as best you can. Be sure you get those terms defined and be sure you recognize you're in a position to find out that what this guy calls A, this guy over here calls B. Do you guys understand that it's really the same thing and so on and so forth? Uh, the the trick then is to get those and distill those into more fundamental type concepts. What you do is, this is I, my idea, I have had varying degrees of success in this. When it's been successful, it's been spectacular. And when it's been failure, it's been equally spectacular. You come to recognize that what the different people are talking about is really goals of a more common thing. And when you get that, and of you and say, wow, how many years have you been in this business? I say, well, you know, a week and a half. Okay, but but get them to understand that these are really examples of the same thing, then they they learn something. And create the experience of having learned that. They have to be willing to go into it with an open mind, and that's the problem with everybody. And uh, but my problems I get is since I get hired by the IT department and I come up with something slightly abstract, like, ah, the user will never buy it. And yeah, well, they don't know well. that. Yep. You know, Paul, they just write, write write these people off, but they'll never understand it. Yeah. So, Paul, you, you've done some writing and some talking. You, I know you and I have talked about this generalization special, specialization thing. Do you, have you not changed over the years? Do you see it? Um, or or just as something that uh, one person told me, it was just a lazy data modeler because eventually you end up with thing related to thing. So what's your thoughts on that? Well, from the, I mean, in in the book that that, that I wrote with Len, um, we there are levels and layers of of approach. You need to be generalized. Sometimes you need to be fundamental. Some other times it depends. I'm just like going out in the Day, you know. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're talking to, every time you talk to IT or the business or whoever, you you know it's it, it's if they're interested in the movies, talk about the movies. I mean, it's just you, you, all that stuff is is you know on your audience. However, what you, you guys just raised something that occurred to me when you were talking there is a is maybe a fundamental problem or fundamental hurdle that we have to get over in patterns. Um, that is on um, t- in template patterns. Is that when we create template 
patterns around orders or contact mechanisms or other categories that David expressed or your own. Um, we, we apply a set of semantics to them that, we, that people like ourselves and David and Len have really tried to be careful about. However, the problem the pattern is, is that it, there are, are semantics. Now, we're, and we try to be careful. We try to be as general as possible so that an order means an order, and we try to define those things. Yeah. Can you apply that pattern to an organization that doesn't they don't think that potato is potato? They describe potato as pomme de terre. You, know, <laughs> you can still make mashed potatoes and, and, and french fries from them, but they call them something different. So that's semantics. Is, is it, and it is a little weakness that we can be aware of. Yeah. When you apply a pattern yeah. to it, just have to be aware. However, <laughs> having said that, yeah. a... a, a when you go build yep. a cantilever bridge across the, the Manhattan, across the the the, the, um, the Eastward in New York, I mean, it's not look exactly the same. The Manhattan Bridge doesn't look like the Brooklyn Bridge, doesn't look like the Williamsburg Bridge. It's all different. They're all basic fundamental patterns that have been applied, but they get applied differently given the different circumstances. Mm. So interesting thing about how the patterns work. Um, I'm wondering if either one of you, have you been plopped into a project where management, either through golf course acquisition or vis convention <laughs> acquisition, has purchased a very expensive or other data model and another internal architects, either data or process architects, involved in evaluating or assessing it? So they ever had to live with patterns that were acquired through not architecture reasons? I'll go first on that one. <laughs> well, I I have been in situations where they had done that, and my first objective is to throw them out. Yeah, they've committed so to their six million. Well, so you get them to throw away six million dollars. Well, it is. It's not so much that. Well, no. What I had was it was industry patterns. They hadn't actually paid anything for them okay. in, in the oil and gas industry, and, yeah. and everybody was was thrilled because this is the oil and gas industry standard. And, and the thing is, it didn't make any sense. Had to. The first job was to kind of gently show them that it really didn't make any sense. And there was a similar thing in the banking. Uh, was actually brought in to help them select a an industry model because they didn't want to do their own model. And so the first thing I did was to draw the model of banking because I needed that in order to, to judge the other models. Uh, in one case, we bought, we, we only selected the one that I thought was pretty good uh, just before the bank got bought by somebody else so the whole thing came to an end. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one, we wound up getting the IBM thing, which is an absolute monstrosity. It actually had a whole lot of really good stuff in it, so I, I couldn't fault them for picking it. But it was very clear that the job of managing this model was going to be horrendous, and nobody yep. had shown much sophistication in modeling <laughs> that they were going to be able to do that. And yep. it was I think many years later, a friend of mine works for that company, and the model is still there, and they still haven't figured out what to do with it. <laughs> but you, Paul? I'm not sure, actually. I, I, you okay. know, I have to be honest there. Normally, not, not really. I've, I've always come in, and because it's, it's not, the problem is not, is not with pattern models that existed from somewhere else. It's the existing thing. That built yeah. over built at some yeah. point and that gets dragged out. You know? Anything? No, I, I, it, it's never. You see, I, I referred to my answer earlier on, my lord. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, my lady. It's 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 not. It, it's things that are in a, in a way I kind of say not bad or good as whether it's used or not. I mean, yeah, it's what right. David said about the oil and gas industry model, I've had a, the exact same experience. And it was the fact that it's a bad model or a good yeah. It wasn't useful for those circumstances that we were in. So it was like, mm-hmm. in a way, we're proving usefulness. Okay, this mm-hmm. isn't useful. Yeah. So. Since you brought that up, what, how, how do you very quickly find what's a useful pattern model? Well, I think, you know, that's, that's a really... That's a really a good question. And the, way I, the way I always do it is scenario based. I mean, there's a standard in a way. If you, I, I refer to the thirds rule. There's a, the 
the company does addresses and phone numbers, so you know a scenario at that, and that applies to everybody. Every comms company supports networks and supports uh, pro, uh, plans, tele, telecommunication plans, or every financial company does trades and risk and analysis and does, you know, forwards and one and options, etc. Tro, tro those scenarios out of throw those trading scenarios out of this one is is when you throw the the last set of things, the last set of scenarios that the business uses that are completely unique to that business. So I was at an engineering company and we were evaluating a, a project planning um kind of model that they were going to apply and the, the scenarios that this great engineering company did just blew the crap out of the model and just wouldn't work for it because they were so different. Interesting. So, it's, so that's how I approach it. Good. Um, define. Let me repeat the question. Yeah, define, how do you define what's define useful what it, for. A path? Um, well, the easy answer is you know they can use it to build something, which is is kind of uh, punting, which is not really the answer I want. Um, because I want to know that it's useful because the shell against some billion so that suddenly comes to comes to bear. Uh, <laughs> a really hard answer. Uh, it, there are places where it it becomes evident that it's useful. Uh, there are other places where because they're not in a position to use it, it's not. Uh, it's the whole bit. So when you're teaching, you know, are you teaching them what they want to hear, what they're in a position to learn? It's, it's the old book on, on endless childhood. But if if, if a person is prepared to deal with what it is you have, then it's gold. It's wonderful. Uh, if they're not, then it, which isn't useful because it's not it's not doing what they're after. Now that's a very good generalization, but I don't know how to be more specific than that. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, that's also something you know. Sometimes I'm asked to help help people evaluate pattern models and. I mean, I'm lucky in that I am only doing it for one specific project, so I can treat it almost mm-hmm. the same as evaluating a software application. Like, you know, mm-hmm. know what we need to do. We need to see whether it covers the same scope, whether it meets, you know, the principles of the business, whether it follows the culture of how we do design. Because, and to show my, my bias is the type of projects I've been working on lately are definitely we're building something necessarily acquiring it for some strategic enterprise reason, but to assess whether this pattern and a whole bunch of other patterns, XML patterns and software patterns and and tools and, and support tools, whether they're going to help us build something and get it into production, keep it in production. It actually raises a different point, and that is that I, I don't, strictly speak, sell my patterns. I sell books, and I love it when people buy mm-hmm. my books, but, but my uh, I, the patterns are tools that I have. And, and each project, in a sense, is you know starting from zero in the sense that I've got this tools in my pocket. Oh, that's an example of one of those. Fine. That's an example of one of those. That's good. That's an example of one of those. I can do a model very, very fast because I have the patterns in my toolbox. Really go in saying, in fact, I get in trouble if I do. In some cases, I tried to say that, and they go, they threw me out because you, know, <laughs> you don't know anything about this business. What are you, what are you saying? You got, you got models for this already. And so I... I tend to try not to say that, to say, well, all right, let's see what we can do here. Well, yeah, you've got a, a, um, uh, you've got a product structure and you've got a, 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 you know, some sort of ordering thing going on. And, and it happens. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's funny. I try to go in with to that general to start with. And I do a much more particular model. And then I do another model. And I do another model. I say, well, so I should have started with more general because they were, in fact, going to the, the same place. But no, it's it's the modeling experience that is where the patterns are useful. Uh, yeah. The patterns as a product per se, I don't think work because um, people know how to use them, and it's it's my skill in using the patterns that is what they pay me for. Interesting. So since we're talking about usefulness, one of my interests when I look at these pattern models, I mentioned at the top of the hour was formats they come in. So certainly the patterns that I've seen from you guys are ERD-based, but as I tweeted during our thing, is the most common format that these data modeling patterns are released in are XML. And I think partly that's because people think them, yeah, that people who are building them aren't data modelers, but have XML. 
and I haven't how they actually think of data. seen those, but I have been fighting. The, there is this thing in the government called NEEM, yeah. um, which is their attempt to communicate between agencies. And so this yeah. XML, and the point is that they don't have the underlying models that understand what the stuff is that they're sending from one to another. So, and, and, and many actually agencies that's... discover that, and they sit down and they say they do a data model, but but they really are off the bad start just because of that. So I'm familiar with Neem, and definitely it um, will tell you it's not a data model. It's a mm -hmm. sharing standard. So if you're going to share this mm -hmm. information, here's the and actual XML messages. So it's definitely a, mm -hmm. phys a very physical type pattern um, mm -hmm. that is intended to be implemented. Right, it's mm -hmm. not a logical model of any type, and that's one mm -hmm. form of it. But we'll talk about XML data model patterns. I'm talking about persistence layer. You know, here's how you think oh. of customer. Here's how you think of location. And for me, XML is a bad fit for that. Not just because I'm a data modeler and intend to think in ERDs, but because it's really hard to express the um, complexity of data at rest. Data is much more complex mm -hmm. at rest than when we're sending it. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. I've also seen UML models, uh, both class models and various different forms of them. Um, an awful lot of them come only as pictures and diagrams. So there's what I say, not really a model, just a picture. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering, uh, part of the reason why these people release them in that format is nobody's asking for them in something that's easily consumable by data modelers. I, or even very cool by human beings. Good. I actually have a fundamental problem with what you. What you okay. I, I think that. I think that is. Um, I think we're in a trick, guys. Right. Mm -hmm. so what we're expressing is a fundamental pattern around mm -hmm. um, around data. Right. Yeah. If we if we really want to express it, we're it's like a it's like a diamond that there are multiple different facets. We happen mm -hmm. to concentrate, or the facet we happen to concentrate on is the relational facet. There's an object-orientated rendition of it. There's an XML rendition of it. There are different editions, different ways of looking at this particular yeah. diamond. And for completeness sake, for, for, um, to, to express data in a, com in a complete fashion, we should be addressing our data modeling patterns and the 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 of object patterns that support and work with them, prompts at XML that works with them, the, the, all the different facets to give a truly, you know, a holistic. Right, but this, this gets to this this gets to a distinction that I make in my video, and that is that that the essential level, the, 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 what I call an architectural level, um, this ontology, this is the nature of the world. As soon as you start talking about a relational database or an object-oriented uh, model or XML, you're talking about a particular way of representing the data. And this is very specific to the kind of technology you're talking about. But the next layer down, that's the next level. And, mm -hmm. and I believe all of those, no matter where you came from, you want to start with, with this essential model and, and drive each of those, those things from that. If you start one of those, then, then you get in trouble when you try to go to a different one because there's no direct translation across. Right. Uh, that's why we have that's why we have architects, right? So, so just to <laughs> clarify with what Paul said, it's not saying expressing an XML is wrong, or an OO model is wrong, right. or a UML model is wrong. But that, um, so I have a couple assumptions here that if it's a if it is a data model that isn't you know an implementation component, it's not a component I'm buying mm -hmm. like snippets of code. Mm -hmm. Is that the further away it is? Is for the hard it is for a data modeler to consume it and then start working with it and tailoring it, the harder it is to be productive with it. So the, my big big believe with this is that some expensive third party models are only provided to you in Word documents in PDF format. The thought of having to retype even if I'm tailoring it, potentially mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of objects oh, yeah, yeah, and definitions yeah. And even yeah. consuming them in XML form, if it's a true think of as a data model, and definitely XML can express mm -hmm. a data model as well, can produce my data model in sure. XML, okay. right? Is that sure. making it harder to consume is also one mm -hmm. of the biggest 
cost barriers and, and makes it less useful. That was my I, point. Yeah, the, the thing is, the models you're describing are what I call archaeology. Uh, I, I get them occasionally, <laughs> and basically my job is to go in and figure out what's the underlying, what's really there. And, and that's such an intellectual exercise, but it's not useful by itself. That, that if I look at that, I can come up with a model that then you can read and manipulate and understand, and then we can talk, talk about it. Uh, you can't from the original models. Yeah. Uh, in a way, Karen, maybe the only true way to express a pattern correctly is mathematically. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, you've lost that. me there, but it sounds really quotable. I wish someone would tweet that. Yeah. I'd like to see that in my tweet stream any minute. Uh, and we're actually getting close to the top of the hour. again. We've got five more minutes. So um, because we have five minutes, Dave, I'm going to ask you to give your one or two sentence takeaway. And I know that's a huge challenge for you. So <laughs> one or two sentences only. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is, this is, <clears throat> oh. Sorry. I try to find the underlying simplicity. Is ostensibly a very complicated world. And I Excellent. Paul? Don't build a wheel. Go buy David's book, buy Land's book, buy my book, buy those models. You can use them, you may not use them, but at least you know, go through them and they may give you some inspiration. Don't try and reinvent the wheel yourself. Yeah. I think that's really Kind of my takeaway. I mean, both of you are, are spot on here. Is don't make it over complicated, and um, there's just no reason to just start at a blank page and start thinking, hmm, what should we? What information should we keep about a customer? We shouldn't just go to our <laughs> old systems either, right? We shouldn't mm -hmm. just have to do that as well. Is that we should mm -hmm. be able to look at patterns and products and and all of those things. I think the whole, you know, every data modeling class I have been on, well, most of them, don't even mention the concept of you don't just start from a blank page, that the vast majority mm -hmm. of work we do is within the context of pre-existing systems and data patterns already there, right or wrong, mm -hmm. and third-part patterns mm -hmm. and the industries worked on them. I think that's all great. Um, I through the chat, since we have a couple more minutes, and I, I think in general our uh, our third panelist audience was in agreement with what I said and or what Alva said and they also shared some other insights and, and experiences they have. I know when Shannon does the follow up, um we usually try to summarize this stuff and um there's no slides to share. Oh I have one more, more poll. I should do that really quick. And get it to come up. Let's poll three while I'm talking. So you're more or less interested in using pattern models. Can I vote, Karen? Yeah, if you can take a poll. Yeah. No. Right. Vote Everyone needed. voting away. <laughs> hey, and I'm going to go ahead and start closing the poll, which will take 20 seconds while it comes up. Um, what happened? I wanted to make sure that uh, to thank again our, our sponsor, CA Irwin Data Modeler, uh, and the people at CA for making this webinar happen, and David and Paul for being such great moderated speakers. I know both of you could talk for hours on this, as could I, which <laughs> is also part of the claim to be a dispassionate moderator on all this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and show the poll results. And... Um, about 22 people, about a quarter of you are now more interested in pattern models. About 35% of you is that, yeah, I'm just the same. And one person, I so should guess who that is, who's less interested, and a chunk of you who get no answer, um, which means you're not sure, I guess, or you forgot to look at the poll. Um, I want to thank everyone for doing this. It seems like the time went by so fast this time. Our, uh, the normal time period for our webinar is actually Thanksgiving Day. So I'm going to let you guys all be thankful in the U.S. and the rest of the world will just be a million times more productive while everyone in the U.S. Yeah. is and not bugging us. Mm, and <laughs> so we're going to move it to, I, I believe it is in early December, the first Thursday of 
December, and that topic is going to be the Data Professional Holiday Wish List, and we're going to have a group of people and talk about what toys, gadgets, tools, and wishes we have for data professionals for the coming year. So join us there. So Shannon, you, you have some closing thoughts? If you, there you go. Well, just of course, I want to say thank you to Paul and David. Thank you for joining in. I'm so glad that we got you on um, and <laughs> and got you working. And, and thank you, as always, and also, uh, you know, to reiterate the sentiment, thank you as to CA, as always, for sponsoring and just enabling us to do these webinars for free for everybody. So that's just great. Uh, and, you know, I love the chat and I love the engagement that just goes on. We'll make sure and get a copy out of that out to everyone as well. And I'll, I'll send a, a links to the recording along with the links to the chat and uh, as well as links to David and Paul's books so that you guys have access to those as well. Excellent. And um, we generally stay on for a few minutes after, after the recording is turned off and um, you attendees are, are welcome to stay after too. And uh, if you have any other questions especially ones that you'd like to have answered with the recording turn off, please go ahead and do that. The recording is now.